But you know, like that moment in the movie where the, where the bomb explodes and it slows down and you, know, you see the big flames and everything. So we, we knew that the bomb was going to explode. We knew that the epidemic was really spiraling out of control because of all the different stories and rumours we were hearing every day. Um, but it was happening slowly. It was sort of frame by frame. Welcome back to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast with myself, Owen Walker. In this episode, I'm speaking with Benjamin Black on his recent book launch of Belly Woman. It's a first-hand account of the impact of a humanitarian crisis and its impact and access to maternal and reproductive health care. So the book explores global disparity in maternal care, including safe abortion care, alongside the compounding factors of the humanitarian emergency that was the Ebola crisis. Benjamin Black is an obstetrician and gynecologist and holds a specific specific <clears throat> Benjamin Black is an obstetrician and gynecologist and holds a specific interest in how to respond to sexual and reproductive health needs of a population living in remote, resource poor and humanitarian emergency settings. Benjamin studied medicine in London which which was closely followed by a career in obstetrics and gynecology. Between his medical training, he also completed a postgraduate studies in epidemiology and statistics and a master's degree from the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. So he has provided assistance around the world, actually, in places like the Thai Burmese border, East Timor, Uganda, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Namibia, Central African Republic and South Sudan. But he's most importantly worked in the response to the West African Ebola pandemic. But he's most importantly worked in response to the West African Ebola epidemic. Welcome to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast, Benjamin. Thanks a lot for having me. It's good to uh, good to have you on, Benjamin. Could I just initially get you to speak to a brief synopsis of the book for listeners? Sure. So, so the book's called Belly Woman, and it, I mean it. it it's, it's a bit difficult sometimes to give a synopsis because it, it talks about lots of different things. But essentially, it is the story of the journey that I went on working in Sierra Leone, initially going there to provide maternal health care. Uh, the country at that time, uh, from where the book is set, was ranked as having the highest death rate of pregnancy complications in the world. Um, but my arrival in Sierra Leone coincided with the beginning of the Ebola epidemic. And I continued to be engaged in that response uh, for about two years, right through until the epidemic was over. And, and what the book covers is really the, um, the emotional journey of being engaged in, in such a huge and complex humanitarian response, but also the ethical dilemmas that we were faced with and the really difficult decisions we had to make around how you can continue or try to continue providing sexual and reproductive health care amidst another huge humanitarian crisis and, and what you do afterwards and that rebuild. Um, it talks a lot about my own reflections also going through the COVID pandemic and, and still being in, in frontline healthcare. Uh, and also, and I think maybe uh, centrally, it talks very much about my colleagues and about the experience of, of them and, and what it was um, for, for the Sierra Leonean healthcare workers who didn't have the, you know, the luxury that I had of being able to, to leave whenever I wanted and who, who really were... Um, fighting throughout every day um, and, and, and seeing it through to the end. We spoke just now offline about how candid the account is really and how granular it is. And I think that the beauty of that is that it really brings you into your shoes and really is quite a visceral experience reading the book, actually. But could you maybe speak to, indeed, whether you found, and this is a personal question, whether you found sort of a, a transfer of psychological weight through, and whether it was cathartic, just transferring your notes, reflections and memories onto a book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cathartic is absolutely the right word. I came out of um, those two years with so much that I wanted to to tell. You know, I, I had been a witness to, to, 
to a lot of the, the key moments of the epidemic, uh, but also I had been a witness to the destruction of maternal health care services and the need to rebuild them. And a lot of that I felt just hadn't been picked up in the in, in the general media or it hadn't necessarily come through in, in other um, resources talking about the epidemic. Um, on top of that, I, you know, I had, as you said, you know, my own emotional um, journey that I've gone through. And, and although, uh, you know, as with the organization, MSF, Medicine Sans Frontières, um, and they're, you know, they're very supportive and they're great and they, they'll get you to see a psychologist when you're, when you're coming out of um, these difficult uh, placements. Uh, but that just wasn't the way that, that I needed to explore what I'd gone through. It just, for whatever reasons, it didn't seem to... Um, resonate with me but what did work for me was sitting down and putting it on paper and i'd sort of been doing that um ad hoc during during the epidemic writing articles for for a couple of newspapers and blogs um to try and get the story out but um it was yeah absolutely cathartic and i you know i would sit you know the, the words really flowed out of me very easily um because the story was there it needed to come out but i also um would often you know stop and sort of have have a moment as I was writing it um, because some, uh, as you know from reading it some of it is quite um, uh, challenging you know some of those situations are challenging um, but um, but I, I hope that you know by sort of putting it on paper you, you know the, the, the intention is that it's a testimony to that time and that there is a record um, of those events um, that by doing that I um, I'm not trying to um, share my emotional burden on the reader. What I'm intending to do is to um, give the reader a window in, into that story and into those, those difficult times and those decisions. So looking at your background, actually, Benjamin, and your catalogue of, of kind of missions throughout the world in different contexts. Could I ask you what sort of draws you to humanitarian and indeed emergency situations? So um, I'm one of those people who always wanted to be a, in, engaged in, in aid work and humanitarian aid, even from a quite a young age. And a, a large part of that is my own family background and my own family history. Uh, so I am um, I'm of mixed mixed descent and mixed heritage, but uh, although I'm born in the UK and I've had a very um, privileged upbringing in many ways, my family history is one of um, refugees and forced migration, um, fleeing genocide uh, and, and pogroms. Um, and, and I've sort of really grown up with those stories and with that, that history. And, and this isn't... Um, a long history, this is, you know, my parents, my grandparents, my aunts, uncles, uh, so certainly really first degree relatives. And so I um, always felt a strong uh, belief that this was this was an area of work that I wanted to go into, that uh, being in a field where rather than being the person who has had to rely on strangers in times of need, but to be in many ways that stranger in a time of need, um, the the way that I ended up coming into obstetrics and gynecology through that was was because, you know, as a, as a fifteen year old at, at school in Manchester, and I you know speak to the careers counsellor as, as 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 you often do, and, and said I want to be an aid worker, and they said, all right, uh, go and be a doctor then, <laughs> which probably in in hindsight probably wasn't wasn't necessarily the the best advice, but that that was the way that I did it. That was. Uh, why I ended up going down the medical route. Uh, but very quickly, once I started engaging in this type of work, um, I, I began to realise how huge the needs were in, in sexual and reproductive health. And, and the, that ticked many, many of the boxes for me, you know, from a public health side, as well as the medical, surgical, um, reaching populations, which were quite often... Um, the least resilient or the, or, or, or the most vulnerable. Uh, and that, that's how I ended up going down this this route. So Benjamin, as, as you write the first part of the book, the book is into, it's sort of separated into three parts. And the first part, part really denotes your journey to Sierra Leone. Your first part denotes your journey to Sierra Leone and indeed you getting used to the 
INGO, so the International Non-Government Organization, uh, in in the midst of an emergent epidemic uh, such as Ebola, could you maybe just speak to the the feelings of uh, that you that, that you possessed at the time, trying to navigate a large organization, but also in the midst of this emergent epidemic? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because I think navigate is definitely the right the right word. Um, the uh, so I was working, as I said, for MSF, but I, I have worked with other large organisations, and um, and I'm sure many of many of the people listening to this podcast as well have got experience of working with large large NGOs or, or indeed in the National Health Service. And there is um, that learning curve of communication um, and and how you at least for me, one of the big navigations that I needed to learn, and I think in many ways I'm still learning because I'm not particularly good at it, is, is you know, who do you speak to when? And, um, you know, how, how do you navigate a lot of the um, the egos, for for want of a better word, um, that, that, that are there? Because quite often you, uh, or at least I found, you know, I would need to speak about certain issues and I wouldn't always know exactly who is the right person to go to, and it's so easy to offend people um, if you if you go to the wrong one at the wrong time, or if you somehow jump that uh, line of communication. Uh, having said that, um, I think that it's often necessary as well. Um, it's often much more efficient, uh, but but it does come with <laughs> with a bit of aggro. Uh, so so, um, and in short, I'm not sure that I have completely learn how to navigate it because I still I still work for MSF I, I'm, I'm now an advisor with, with the head office but but I'm, I'm always trying to figure out exactly how to navigate the, these large organizations um, to you know to get the effect th- th- that I feel is needed at that time um, as far as the you know the the epidemic the, the thing with the epidemic was it it really felt at the time like it was moving quite slowly. So it was a little bit like being in a movie and and watching everything on slow motion. Like you knew, you, 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 we knew, you know, like that moment in the movie where the, where the bomb explodes and it slows down and you know, you see the big flames and everything. So we, we knew that the bomb was going to explode. We knew that the epidemic was really spiraling out of control because of all the different stories and rumors we were hearing every day. Um, but it was happening slowly. It was sort of frame by frame. Um, and that was really interesting because we felt like, well, there's there's time to to respond. There's time to to preempt this, to mitigate this. And of course, that never happened. Uh, despite lots of discussion, those actions just didn't come into play. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, that's probably one of the big lessons that people talk about as well from from the west african epidemic uh whether or not we've learned them um to be seen but yeah so benjamin just looking at the chapter at the at the end of the first part of the book around exodus and some of the terrifying accounts of ebola being contracted by the staff caring for ebola patients could you could you maybe speak to that because again as we're speaking offline it's, it's multifactorial it's it's not just they're not just Ebola patients. You've built rapport up with these staff. You you know them by name, by nature, by family. Uh, could could you maybe speak to to those accounts? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's worth noting that. So so Ebola in itself, um, it's it's, you know, it's a very deadly disease, and and at that time, um, if you caught Ebola, then then the chance of you surviving was was about 30 percent or less um for pregnant women it was less than 10 percent um and in west africa the chance of you catching ebola if you're a healthcare worker was 32 times greater than it was for the general population and that's because ebola's sped through bodily fluids and and of course if you're looking after sick people and you don't have access to the correct uh ppe or or, or the other infection prevention and control mechanisms, then, then that risk is going to be greater. And so, um, yeah, so in the book, I write about uh, a time in the chapter called Exodus, when as everything was culminating around us, you know, the, the outbreak was exploding. We were in the epicenter. And of course, 
a lot of the people that I worked with who were healthcare workers in the Ebola treatment centers were also members of the community that was being most affected. Um, they were going back to their homes, they were going back to uh, perhaps to homes where people might turn up on their doorstep feeling unwell because they knew that they were healthcare workers and might think it's better to go directly to them. Uh, which, which of course puts them at great risk, but it's also very difficult to turn someone away. And so there was a time when um, people that I lived with and, and also close um, colleagues did become infected with, with Ebola. And I think that what is um, what, I, what I really took away from that was just the huge amount of fear that that came with that because it meant we all knew that it could happen to us uh, there was no there's no ppe that that's ever going to can you know protect you 100 because we were living inside the epidemic and and you know you're not in ppe all the time and 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 with all the best intentions you're we're all fallible um so yeah i mean i would often as i sort of write about it in the book i would often you know, fall asleep at night with my hand on my forehead, just wondering, you know, have I got a bit of a temperature? Um, you know, West Africa is pretty warm and humid at the best of times. And thinking about, you know, what would I do if it was me that felt unwell? What if it, what would I do if I if I thought I had Ebola? Would I would I want to tell people straight away? Would I want to assume that it's malaria just in the hope that it's not Ebola? Because it comes with so much baggage. Once once you've got Ebola, you know that means being isolated, going into the Ebola treatment centre, not being able to see family, friends. Um, and, you know, this was this was at a time when people hadn't, uh, outsiders, international staff hadn't yet been infected. So, so it was really new, um, you know, would you be able to be evacuated? Um, and what did that mean from an ethical perspective that I can be evacuated, but my colleague can't? Um, so so it was, it was a morally difficult time but but it was also absolutely very frightening um for, for all of us but I, I but i'd still say that the greatest burden was certainly on my uh, local colleagues one thing you do know in the book actually benjamin is is around this preventable death in, in in maternal care and some of the steps which can be taken for preventable death could you so the second part of the book has has got belly woman uh, as a chapter and talks candidly about some of the preventable death that or, or indeed unnecessary death you saw about around you could you could you maybe speak to to that yeah i mean i think if we're talking specifically about pregnant women um and and so i you know a lot of the work that i do still still today is really focusing on how can we prevent maternal deaths um both, both in high income settings, but particularly uh, within my work with MSF, within within resource poor settings. And my starting point is always that we know that nearly every single maternal death is avoidable. Um, if if there was the right access to healthcare or decisions were made a little bit quicker, um, you know, it's it's not only down to the healthcare workers. It also comes into play with what are the political situation, economic, cultural, uh, but ultimately they, those deaths can be avoided, and those deaths are um, of huge significance because when a pregnant woman dies, you know, the tragedy is not only the tragedy of her losing her life; it's also this massive ripple effect that it has, because. Um, Let's say, for example, that the, the baby that she was pregnant with had survived, the chances of it making it to its first birthday are dramatically, dramatically reduced. Over 30, in some contexts, uh, some countries, over 30 times less likely to survive purely because the mother didn't survive. But for other children, other existing children, their chances of, of um, dying or becoming civilly unwell, um, for girls being married off at very young ages or exploited, uh, and, and of course, just just the, the, the impact it has on the social fabric. Um, so, uh, so, so it's, you know, it is at the core and part of what this book is about is talking about, you know, making sure that we can try to reduce the, these really unnecessary deaths. Um, and in the, the chapter Belly Woman that, that, that you mentioned, what I'm describing really is what about pregnant women who got infected with Ebola? Did they need to die? And 
And it's an interesting question because, like I said at the beginning of the epidemic, the, the assumption was from, from previous Ebola outbreaks that 90% of pregnant women who get infected with Ebola will die and 100% of the babies. Uh, but what we found was that, you know, a lot of this was, was maybe down to some of the assumptions that we as healthcare workers already held. But, and also maybe the fear that we had, because of course, bodily fluids, when you think about pregnancy, there's a lot of bodily fluids involved in maternity and in childbirth. Uh, but what we found was that by making really simple interventions and, and, you know, really not rocket science, you know, simple interventions that we know work in a normal non-Ebola context. So making sure there's early and quick access to drugs that can reduce bleeding after birth, um, giving the woman herself those medications to keep with her. So if she did give birth when the healthcare worker wasn't nearby, she could self-care um, because of course it, take, it takes time to get into the PP, it takes time to get into the, into the treatment center and, and having everything that we needed immediately available with that woman rather than having to ask people to throw things over a fence because of the separations with isolation. And what we found was that through these small interventions, the chance of a pregnant woman with Ebola dying by the end of the epidemic was actually the same as the chance of her dying if she hadn't been pregnant at all, which is still very high. By the end of the epidemic, that was about a 50-50 chance. But what it told us was that a lot of those deaths probably were not from Ebola. They were maybe, um, Ebola was certainly an underlying cause, but they probably died from something like hemorrhage or uh, a complication of pregnancy that did have treatment that, that could have been given. Um, and it's, you know, the, the, that, the principle behind that really speaks to, you know, a lot of the ways that we talk about when we talk about trying to reduce maternal morbidity and maternal mortality in resource poor settings. And, and you know, many people will have heard of this, the construct of the three, de three delays, uh, the idea that, you know, it's the, the delay in uh, recognizing that there's a problem, getting to a health facility and, and then getting care in that health facility. Um, and really what we were taking was that same idea, you know, what can we do to make sure that the recognition, the receipt of healthcare and the right healthcare is available as quickly as possible. And it absolutely does, does reduce um, an av avoidable deaths. So Benjamin, could you speak to sort of the final part of the book and sort of your, your reflections in the final part of the book around sort of the culmination of the epidemic and then eventually sort of the dissipation of the disease? Yeah, so the... The, the way that the Ebola epidemic, um, the journey, certainly the journey that I went through in the Ebola epidemic was at the beginning where there was a lot of Ebola and very few um, people responding. So we were really quite overwhelmed. And then you sort of had this moment where everything sort of turned upside down because suddenly everybody was coming. Uh, you know, the response really kicked into action and, and, and a lot of organisations that didn't want to be involved in Ebola response I guess in some ways felt like they needed to be because that that was the way things were moving. But actually the number of cases was, was starting to drop quite dramatically. And we suddenly had um a lot of a lot of responders and and, and not so many patients. Um which which was which was um complicating in itself. And I write a little bit about that in the book, about that that change and that that transition in 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 um the mentality of the response, but also the reflections that people from different parts of that response had uh, and, and judgments that maybe um, were made. As the, um, as the epidemic was ending, uh, what, well, really before the epidemic was ending, one of the big questions that was for me and for some of my colleagues was, you know, going back to the, the question around maternal and sexual reproductive health. Because what happened during the epidemic was that those healthcare services, despite there already being a really poor baseline, those healthcare services either ground to a halt or became too um, feared by the population to be accessed. And, you know, at the peak of the epidemic, the estimations were that about one in seven pregnant women were dying uh, from pregnancy related causes. Now, you know, what, what I'd say is we don't know if it ever got that bad. That was the, that was the estimate and, and probably it didn't, didn't reach that. Um, but that was what we were being told at the time. And certainly it, it had worsened. There's no question that it had worsened. Um, also through, through the loss of so many healthcare workers, which were already quite low to begin with. So, so a lot of what we were then 
talking about and thinking about was, you know, how can we re-engage with healthcare services and re-engage with populations to um, to to try to strengthen uh, those maternal health care services and, and broader sexual reproductive health services, but also how can we engage with populations to try and um, give them that encouragement that it is safe to use these ser- services and, and that, that, you know, you're not going to get Ebola uh, coming to, to give birth. Uh, and that, that was a huge part of, of what our time and our energy, and, and as you said, sort of the third part of the book talks about that um, trying to trying to rebuild. So looking at the sort of narrative within the book, and we spoke earlier about it just being extremely personal uh, from your thoughts and fears, actually, Benjamin, could you could you maybe speak to some of the the salient lessons you learned from your time in Sierra Leone and indeed treating Ebola patients within the epidemic, just around controlling your own emotions? Because, you know, I've worked for a number of NGOs as well and it is a roller coaster and can be a roller coaster did did, did it teach you anything um I think for, for, I'm not sure that I can I can say that I that I learned to control my emotions but but certainly I think that what it did tell me is you have to be kind to yourself and you've also got to be kind to the people around you uh, and and I mean that in the broadest of terms, uh, because I think that we do still often have that image in our mind of the international aid worker with the other international aid workers. But when I say the people around me, I mean everyone. I mean my my local colleagues and the population that that, that you're working with. Uh, I think that you know we we're much better now of talking about burnout uh, in in both the aid sector, but also within within the medical. Uh, field more generally but there is there is still that challenge of you know when you're the one burning out you often have the lowest amount of insight into it and I uh, certainly got to a point and I, and I do write about it in the book where I was burning out and and that was because you know I had two years uh, been in this response I had been um really facing these these huge challenges and, and and you know a lot of the challenges were internal challenges the, the battles that we go through within the organizations trying to ensure that the priorities that i was seeing so for example ensuring that there's access to contraception when when your healthcare services have stopped functioning are the same priorities that the people who have the keys to to making that happen feel um the all the things around trying to provide maternal health care in in that setting and then of course the Ebola epidemic in itself and um and I didn't I didn't recognize that I was burning out till someone else told me and and I and I do think that part of what happens when you burn out is you become less kind um certainly for me I I was becoming less kind to myself I was I was pushing myself harder and harder I felt that everything depended on me um, which sounds incredibly narcissistic, but, but it's not my intention. But what I mean is, you know, I felt I have to be up at five o'clock every morning. I've got to be working from the moment I wake up and I can't be doing anything that isn't going towards that goal of trying to, at that time, either respond to the Ebola epidemic or, or improve maternal health care. Um, there was there was no breathing space for anything else. And And if the people around me weren't doing the same, then I probably wasn't as kind to them as I should have been because I didn't have that, the understanding that, that I should have had because I was also much more exhausted and probably emotionally out of touch myself than I should have been. Um, so I think that um, that that certainly is, a, is a, has been a lesson for myself, um, knowing when to step back, knowing to the importance of taking breaks, but also the importance of recognising that if that's happening to me, it's probably also happening to other people around me and um and just being kind to to them because you don't you never know what's going on in other people's lives um you might be having a bad day <laughs> but but you you know taking it out on someone else that their day might be much worse so there might be other stuff going on that we're not aware of um i also found that you know i did have a tendency to disconnect emotionally um and i you know we all as we already sort of mentioned about the writing of the book uh as a cathartic process you know we have different ways of, of dealing with the things that we see uh but i found that 
I, particularly during the peak of the Ebola epidemic, when I was working in, at that time, one of the only functioning Ebola treatment centers every day, we were dealing with, with a, you know, a lot of patients, but also a lot of really distressing and sad stories. Just to say, the book, <laughs> the book's not only distressing and sad stories, there is also a lot of hopeful stories um, and, and a lot of, uh, of stories of overcoming adversity. But, but of course, from a personal level, you're taking that all in. And, and what I found was that I, at some level, just disconnected from the emotional content of what I was seeing and dealing with. Um, which is why, you know, I, I sort of write about the, when I came out of the field and I, and I spoke with a psychologist and, um, and I was just completely blunt, you know, the, the psychologist was asking me, so, you know, what, what, what happened? What have you seen? Um, and, and the, you know, the consultation ended with the psychologist having to end it because she was so upset by what I was telling her, but I, I just was completely numb, numb to it. I had not, um, connected the dots inside myself. And, and I think, yeah, having that awareness that, that sometimes it's necessary, you know, we all, we all have to disconnect from time to time to do what we need to do. Uh, but finding a way back to, um, yeah, to resolve those emotions. I think it's a great baseline to come back to is like you were saying, you know, is an analog of comparison. If I'm struggling, who else around me is, is struggling. And it's, it's always great to ask those questions actually and really insightful to do so and Benjamin within the book you draw comparison to the COVID-19 pandemic and sort of some of the identify some of the root causes around sort of poor public health poor access to health care and then just some of the fundamentals around compliance to to good practice uh, have you seen any advances within working within INGOs since the COVID pandemic from fundamental lessons learned from two, one epidemic and one pandemic? Well, I think that um, I hesitate to, to say if we've learned um, lessons from COVID yet. I, I almost feel like it might be too soon for us to know. And I, the other thing that I often hesitate is with this idea of learning lessons, because I think we're very good at identifying them. Um, we're very good at wringing our hands as, as we did after the Ebola epidemic and, and as we do after most um, humanitarian crises, people will you know, self-flagellate and they'll put their hands up and say, we could have done this better and next time we'll do that better. But whether we actually learn them and, and demonstrate that we're gonna do it better is, is something else. And I think actually, if anything, the COVID pandemic was a very good example of where we failed uh, in many respects, to learn lessons from from other epidemics, and, and there, you know there can be loads of reasons why that might have happened. It, it could be uh, an arrogance that we just uh, for for the UK as a high income country, we didn't think the lessons that apply to resource poor settings applied to us. Um, but it could also be that we just, uh, or I say we, you know, that the decision makers um, just didn't know that those lessons. Um, were there already and and you know and sort of the things that do stand out and i and i do i i do think that these things are improving um but i'm not sure that they're improving specifically because of covid um but the things that really stand out are the way that we engage with communities early on in in, in a crisis particularly an epidemic and uh you know earlier so no, so later last year so in, in october last year there was an ebola outbreak in uganda uh, and actually, as, as we're recording right now, there's just been an outbreak of Marburg declared uh, in Equatorial Guinea. And one of the things that I think has come through in our learning is that from the moment these outbreaks are now identified, one of the first triggers is how are we going to engage with the community? How are we going to be able to transfer um, the, the identification of this illness and, and how to take those public health measures in a way that they will understand and, and 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 i don't mean that in a patronizing way what i mean is you know in a language that it's understood through through people that they trust whether that's religious leaders or um cultural icons or, or people that you know speak more more to the adolescent population or to the elderly population it's it's not necessarily your politicians you know particularly if you're in a in a country where your politicians aren't the most trusted uh, and i think that we have improved on, um, but I also reflect back on 
on COVID, and I and I think it took a, quite a long time for the UK to to catch up on 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 that um, way of engaging with the population and making sure that all the different um, languages and, and and again like by language I don't just mean different languages as in from different countries, but also speak the the different languages that are needed to have different levels of population here and and also listen back from them. Um, I think more more specifically for for sexual reproductive health care, um, what's been a, a really big challenge for us is the discrimination against pregnant and lactating women. Uh, and you know, in in the Ebola epidemic, certainly in West Africa, you know, there are just really illogical decisions that were made. You know, so if you go back to that statistic, that um, even if we take the best case scenario, you know, that, that if you're pregnant and you have Ebola, you've got a 50-50 chance of surviving. Bearing in mind the fetus, the, the unborn baby, still had virtually a 100% chance of death. That, that you would, if you're trialing a vaccine that might save, save your life or, or an experimental treatment that might be curable, that you would make a decision not to include pregnant women. Um, you know, and, and this is exactly what happened. And, and trying to explain and advocate that, you know, this, this is a not right, not, not even giving them the choice, you know, not even giving them the agency to be able to say, Do you know what, this is my body, you know, and, and I want the vaccine and I appreciate that there may be some theoretical risks, which by the way, the, the risks to pregnancy from these vaccines was, was virtually nil from a theoretical perspective anyway. Um, and again, you know, thinking to COVID, we saw that happen again. Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of um, advocacy and media attention on making sure that pregnant women get get the COVID vaccine. But if you take your mind back to the beginning of the out of the COVID pandemic, that wasn't the first message that was given. The first message was, we don't know if this is safe in pregnancy, which actually was, you know, looking at everything that we know about vaccines wasn't really all that truthful because we had a very good idea that it was going to be safe in pregnancy. Uh, but once that message has gone out and it's gone out wrong, it's really hard to to go back and, and to tell people, actually, we've changed our mind. It's, it's fine now. Um, but again, I think it's it's a little bit that discrimination. It's a little bit that paternalistic attitude of um, we need to um, protect pregnant women from something. But but actually, what we were doing was was opening them up to more harm. Um, so I think those things are you know again I think that from COVID we, we probably are learning lessons, particularly in that with the with the inclusion of pregnant women in trials and vaccines uh, because there was so much criticism. But we didn't need to learn this during COVID because we'd already learned it before. And that's this, you know, where we identify and where do we learn. Um, but I think, yeah, and, and I think the last thing is is this um, not siloing our responses. You know, we, um, yeah, there's an epidemic. There could be an outbreak of anything. There could be any disaster. You know, we're talking now uh, in the aftermath of this huge, huge earthquake in, in Turkey and Syria. Um there's also going to be a sexual reproductive health crisis in these areas. And, and where we decide, are we focusing on the outbreak? Are we, are we focusing on, on the earthquake? Um, or are we um, including sexual reproductive health? And what, what tends to happen is both happen, but they happen separate from one another. And, it's, and it's, not, it's not helpful because what you need is you need to have both of them engage with one another. Uh, and particularly with Ebola, um, this has been this has really been a big challenge for us because of all the overlapping issues that we see with the symptoms. So the symptoms of Ebola often um, appear the same as the symptoms of complications of pregnancy. And so you really can't have that separation. Otherwise, what you have is um, uh, a really negative impact on, on, on the services and the access to services. So just as we finish off, Benjamin, I, and come into land, it, it's a fantastic read. It's it's very candid, very visceral, very um, emotive, and also, you know, extremely true uh, for, from from a first person perspective. And I think what you illustrate nicely in the book is this multifactorial layer of of relationship, of disease, and um, and almost the. The, the pathological spread of disease, but interspersed with 
like you said, the, this overwhelming aid response, the dynamics of the ETCs, the Ebola treatment centres, and and just and, and just how it played out in a in a very candid way. But could you maybe speak to any final thoughts you'd like to confer to listeners um, if they were to read this book? So you know, when I when I wrote this book, I had lots of different. Um, reasons for doing it as, as I mentioned part of it was was to record and, and to testimony and also because I was in a position that I was able to sit and write this book and and many of my um Sierra Leonean colleagues wouldn't have been in that position having said that um the the names in the book are real you know and and, and my my Sierra Leonean colleagues have all been engaged in in making sure this story get got told and they're uh, a part of this book as much as I am um but what I would like people to take away from this book is this this idea that, you know, when you watch the news and you see a, a tragedy, you see a crisis, whether it's a, a famine or a refugee movement, um, what, what you often won't hear on the news is what's happening to the pregnant women in that population? Um, what impact is this having on sexual reproductive health as far as increase in sexual violence, lack of access to contraception, increase in, in unsafe abortions and and you can be sure that in every humanitarian crisis these things are getting worse uh, there's always a crisis a reproductive health crisis within these crises and i and i hope that by um reading this book and, and you know it's it is non-fiction but it's a narrative it's a story it's a story to be read from, from beginning to end you know it's, it, you can take it as a holiday read it's not a textbook um but but through the experience of reading this story you'll also um, have a window into that um, under crisis that is often, often forgotten about. And yet we really need to be talking about it and making sure that it, that it is um, at the front of our minds. Um, ultimately, you know, and, and, and maybe this is a bit of a call to arms, but, you know, to anyone who's listening to this podcast who works in the humanitarian sector, it really doesn't matter what your role is. It doesn't even matter whether you're medical or you're there as a logistical or comms. If you're engaged in humanitarian response, then sexual reproductive health is your business too, because we, we, we can all do something within these crises to try to reduce the suffering and, and to improve access to care and to advocate for, for the rights of, um, of populations to have adequate access for sexual reproductive health care. Um, so so that, that's really what, what the book's for. Um, but Belly Woman, um, you know, it's it's there if you're interested in humanitarian response and maternal health and, and, and the global disparity, that difference between being a, a pregnant woman in, in a high income country or, or to a low income country. Um, and, and of course, in, in what really happened in West Africa uh, from, an, from an eyewitness testimony, then then I really think that you'll, you'll find it an, an interesting and an, an enjoyable uh, book. Um, I hope, I hope, I hope so. <laughs> And uh, I'd always be happy to hear from anyone who reads it what 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 they find from it. Listen, I very much did, and I just want to thank you, Benjamin, for your time today and your reflections because I think it's important to, like you said, document this narrative both from a personal sort of alleviation and catharsis perspective, but also just as an outsider in, in reading it. And it was very informative to me. So, um, so thank you for your time today. No, thank you. Thank you very much for for speaking with me. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please feel free to rate, review and subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to. Please also head over to the World Extreme Medicine website where you can find more engaging content on extreme medicine webinars and indeed the collection of courses from our global network, including humanitarian, disaster relief, expedition, space, military, tactical and performance medicine. Thanks again. 